John. Uh, we are all uh, all set here, so you can okay. you can start. Great. Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, sorry about the little delay there, getting everything set up, but hopefully this this uh, comes through clear and you can see the slides fairly well. Um, so today I wanted to just take a little bit of time and talk about the OpenStack block storage project, um, Cinder. Um, so me, I, my name is John Griffith. I'm a senior software engineer at SolidFire um, out in Boulder, Colorado in the States. Um, I'm currently the PTL for the block storage project and I'm also a member of the um, OpenStack technical committee. Um, I've been working on Cinder basically since it started. Uh, I was actually spearheaded the charge to pull Cinder out of uh, Nova. So it used to be Nova Volumes uh, a couple years ago. And um, so I drove the effort to try and pull that out and create its own project. Um, the main reason for that was uh, we kind of were talking about some ideas and some different things and we thought that it would be really good for block storage to have it be its own project to get some more emphasis and more focus um, and a little more uh, visibility for people to work on. So um, that's what we did. So I thought I'd take a little bit of time first and, and you know, talk about how the project is run, um, how things work, how code gets contributed, what the PTL does, um, you know, some things like that. And then talk a little bit about the project itself and, and some of the details. And then try and just leave a bunch of time for questions. Um, I wanted to keep this kind of informal. It's a little hard, uh, you know, over Skype. But if if you have questions as we go along, um, just shout. Let me know. Don't don't hesitate to interrupt, and, and I can clarify things. Or if you want to talk in more detail about something, just let me know. So um, just kind of a quick overview of some of the stats that we had in Ice House to kind of give you an idea of the health of the project, um, how many contributions we get, and things like that. Um, there's a website called Stackalytics that, that breaks all this information down really nice. You can check out, but um, you know, just kind of a high level view. There's there's over 159 software developers that have committed code into the Cinder project for this release. Um, the release is a six month cycle, um, so that's that's a lot of a lot of people involved in a six month cycle. Um, there's over 45 different companies that are represented in those numbers. Um, and the, the way that breaks down is 584 commits uh, or patches and about 170,000 lines of code is where we're sitting at for Cinder right now. Um, one of the things I like to stress with, with Cinder and, and really with any OpenStack project is that anybody and everybody documentation, testing, uh, you know, whatever. We, we'd love to have anybody and everybody contribute in some way. So this is kind of a, the life cycle of a code submission, um, sort of how you start and, and how it ends up. Um, on the left side, we have uh, the case of you have a new feature you want to propose and put inside a sender. On the right side, we have a bug fix. Um, so let's talk about the new feature. Uh, the, the first thing we do is we use um, what's called uh, Launchpad for all of our project management. Um, and so the first step is to create a blueprint, which basically just outlines what it is that you want to do. Um, so you'll go and you'll follow a blueprint and you'll say, I want to implement feature XYZ um, and then give some detail as far as why it's useful, how you want to implement it, what the use cases are, things like that. Um, and then what will happen is the PTL will go in and he will approve the blueprint or ask for more information or, you know, whatever, maybe it's already covered, um, something like that. Um, and then you'll go into the common flow, uh, which is work on the code, um, hack the code, run some tests, um, run some more tests. I can't emphasize testing enough. Um, it's, it's an extremely big part. Um, and then submit the review for uh, Garrett. Um, I have a comment down there about be patient, and, and the thing about um, submitting code to OpenStack um, that you'll notice is the review process can take a very long time. Uh, there's significant, a significantly larger number of people contributing code than there are people reviewing code. Um, so what happens is we can get a pretty good backlog. Um, so you got to be really patient, um, and then you also have to be kind of thick-skinned because 
a lot of the folks that review code, um, they can be pretty picky. Uh, they'll, they'll pick out typos, they'll pick out procedural errors, you know, things that they think could be different, that should be better, um, all kinds of things. And, and it's not uncommon for people to submit a patch and go through 20, iter 20 iterations of review before it actually merges. Um, it's, it's kind of discouraging, um, but it's, it's, it's not intended to be that way. It's just intended to try and keep the quality of the code up. So, so uh, you know, I mentioned, uh, you know, starting with a blueprint. Um, this is a, a capture of the page for registering a blueprint. Um, so it's pretty simple. Uh, you know, you start out, you just put in a name, title, um, you know, a short summary, and then typically people will assign it to themselves, although sometimes people just submit blueprints as ideas. You don't actually have to work on it. Maybe you just have an idea of, of something that would make the project better. And that's absolutely fine, so just don't assign yourself. Just put it in there, and then maybe somebody will will see it. You know, there's always people coming to me and saying, hey, I'd like to help out, what can I do? Uh, so this is one of the first things I look at. Um, the uh, important piece that unfortunately is listed here as optional that I don't think should be is the specification URL. Um, and what that is is it, it creates a wiki page and lets you put in significantly more detailed information. Um, the more detailed your blueprint is, the more likely it is to be approved and the more likely things are to go smoothly. Um, so it's really important if you, if you do submit a blueprint, make sure you try and fill that out and put in as much information as you can. So I kind of touch on some of those things here. Um, you know, the more detail, the better. Um, use that specification URL option. Um, it's also really good, you know, before you even do your blueprint, um, hang out in IRC. So there's a uh, Pound OpenStack Cinder uh, channel. Um, all of the Cinder devs, you know, hang out there almost around the clock. There's somebody there. Um, so hang out there and kind of talk to people and throw your idea out there. Um, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great way to get other people's inputs and, and get some suggestions from them on, on what would be a useful feature and, and how you might get your code uh, committed. Um, there's also a weekly uh, Cinder project meeting. Um, drop in, uh, you know, hang out, throw your idea out there, put an item on the agenda list on the wiki, um, and, and we can talk about it there. Um, some of the key things to remember, especially with blueprints, um, the earlier in a release cycle you submit it, the better. Um, so the way OpenStack works is there are six month release cycles and they're usually broken down into three milestones inside of there. Um, so, you know, when you get to the end of one of those milestones, things are really, really hectic. Um, there's a ton of code going in, there's a ton of work that has to be done to actually get the code cut and released and out and everything. So there's a lot of distractions and new submissions, new blueprints, new features and things like that. Um, they tend to drop in priority when you get to those, those points in time. So the earlier in the release, the better. Um, it's also important to note that at the end of the third milestone, um, we implement a feature freeze. So we just flat out reject any new feature requests that come in. Um, so uh, the bottom line on that, you know, plan ahead. Uh, the first milestone is the best time to introduce new ideas and plans. Um, it, it gives you an opportunity to actually talk to people and, and get some feedback and really work on it. And then it also ensures that, um, you know, when it gets in early like that, it ensures that we actually have time to really test it and, and get a lot of testing and stuff like that on it before we actually cut the release and, and ship it out. Um, so, you know, bottom line, timing is everything. Um, uh, so I, I touched on, you know, things about the review process and, and I stress this a lot with people. Um, if you're not familiar with OpenStack and you're not familiar with the review process, um, it, it can be pretty daunting. So, you know, be patient. Um, like I mentioned, there's, there can be a really large uh, backlog. Um, and one of the things I really encourage people to do is, um, you know, while you're waiting for your patch to be reviewed, go review some other people's patches. Um, it's a great way to, to kind of figure out, uh, you know, the, the code flow, how things are outlined, how the process works, things like that. Um, and at the same time, it really helps out the rest of the community as well. Um, 
it's also really good because you know karma is is a true thing and the more reviews if your name shows up in reviewing other people's code they're going to be more likely to come back and review your code as well um, the other thing I, I kind of mentioned this as well is is don't be offended when you get you know silly little nitpicks back on your on your code review um, reviewers can be really tough um, they're they're trying to help their intentions are good um, you know sometimes it's brutal uh, but just be thick-skinned and, and don't take the wrong way they're just trying to help so um, don't forget unit tests we require unit tests for everything that goes in um, you know especially a new feature you're gonna have to write a new batch of unit tests for that um, so that has to be there um, and make sure you actually test your code before you submit it. A lot of people don't do that. Um, so what happens is then we go through the gating process. Um, our automation actually tests everything before it gets committed into the into trunk. Um, and it's kind of silly when you know it goes through and it doesn't even pass the test. So so make sure you run the unit tests. Um, and then uh, you know there's all kinds of uh, you know websites and stuff. And I've got some links at the end of this slide set. Um, they show you, you know, how to contribute, places to get started, information on how to do a good commit message, so on and so forth. So make sure you check those things out if you're new. So I, I thought I'd also talk a little bit about what the um, the role of the PTL is. Um, so the PTL is project technical lead, um, and really for the most part, it's it's a whole bunch of project management. Um, bug triaging, blueprint approval, prioritization of, of when things are gonna get done in a milestone or in a release, so on and so forth. Um, a lot of coordinating efforts uh, between all the different people uh, in the community. For example, I, you know, I pointed out in, in the Cinder project, we had over, you know, close to 150 different engineers contributing code. Um, so it's the PTL's job to kind of try and coordinate all those people and, and try and keep everybody on a set path and keep everybody focused on the same thing. Um, we're also in charge of managing the releases, um, and that means, for example, uh, you know, right now we're in release candidate phase. Um, so what that means for me is one of the things that I have to keep an eye on is new bugs that are coming in from people that are doing testing on those release candidates. Um, what bugs are severe enough and, and important enough and safe enough to backport fixes for and put fixes into the release candidate for? Um, Another one is, you know, of course, being a be an ambassador, uh, which is what I consider, you know, this the sort of thing that I'm doing here today, going out and talking to people about Cinder, um, encouraging people to get involved, raising awareness, things like that. Um, and then my my favorite piece here is pick up the leftovers. Um, so one of the main jobs a, a PTL usually ends up with is um, fixing all the leftover things that nobody else wanted to work on. So. Um, so that's kind of how I see it. And then, of course, I put here, there's an official responsibilities list um, you can check out at the Wiki PTL guide. Any questions on that? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, let's talk about storage. So, um, you know, most of you are probably familiar inside of OpenStack, there's there's basically two different types of storage right now. Um, there's block storage and there's object storage. Um, also on the horizon, you guys can see there's um, uh, file system, uh, shared file system storage that's coming online. So um, each of those different types of storage has a different objective and a different use case. Um, so it's really important to um, kind of understand the differences and, and know what the deltas are between those. Um, you know, you look at block storage, you know, Cinder is definitely more of the um, traditional uh, disk drive based storage. So um, the way Cinder actually presents uh, volumes for OpenStack consumers is basically it's just a raw dip, um, and that's how it works. You look at things like object store on the other hand, and you're talking about actually just dumping full objects over HTTP. Um, so it's significant different use cases there. So Cinder uses a um, plugin architecture for the backend drivers. Um, what that means is um, there are close to 20 different uh, backend storage devices, block storage devices that you can plug into Cinder and use today. Um, there's also a reference implementation 
that uses LVM. So it, if you don't have a storage product or a storage device, that's fine. You can use the LVM implementation, which is which is perfectly good. Um, uh, the the bulk of the devices use iSCSI as the transport protocol. Um, there is support now for Fiber Channel, um, and, and some work is being done on there on that. Um, there's also some support for some other things like I, ISER and some other things like that that are that are being added as well. Um, the thing that's really cool about Cinder is you can mix, match, and, and add and remove different backends as you go. Uh, so, for example, you can start out and just use the base reference implementation of LVM. Um, and then later down the road, as you need more capacity and more storage, you can do things like wheel in a uh, NetApp box or a solid fire box or build your own, you know, stuff cluster, whatever it might be. And you can just keep adding those things um, or taking those things away for that matter. Um, and expanding and, and, and changing your OpenStack deployment um, without losing uh, any of your uptime. Um, one of the things that we focus on with, uh, with Cinder is abstracting out any of those deltas of the back ends. So the end user has absolutely no uh, direct um, information or visibility of what back end device they're actually using. Um, it's just it's just a volume. That's all it is to them. Um, so the so the differences between you know what backend to use and stuff like that, those are really most important to um, the people that are standing up the cloud, whether that be a service provider or an enterprise IT shop, wherever it might be. Um, that's where the differences really come into play, and that that's that's who really needs to look at, look really closely at making those choices. Um, the other thing that that we've been really strict about is um, providing a consistent API, regardless of what backend device. Um, and that's kind of hard to do, right? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of people you get some pushback from because their device can't implement a specific feature that's in Cinder. Um, so what we usually do is we try and, and work together to come up with a generalized implementation that anybody can do. Um, so the difference comes, for example, uh, say like cloning a volume. Uh, we have a clone feature. So if you use the LVM reference implementation right now, what that means is it will take an existing volume uh, and attach it to the center node, create a new one and attach it as well, and then DD the contents of the, of the parent volume across to the second volume. Um, if it happens to be a solid fire device on the back end, um, we have cloning functionality built in. So then the difference is all, all that needs to happen in that case is an API call is sent to the solid fire cluster that says, okay, clone this volume, and you're done. Uh, so, so that's where the differences come in. Um, those differences are, we try to keep those invisible to the end user. Um, the things they may notice are things may take longer, you know, things like that. But every API function should be implemented. There shouldn't be any, oh, I can't do this particular API call because I don't have that back end, right? And that, that's really important. Um, so we have a filter scheduler, um, and that filter scheduler is used. Um, you, you can write custom filters to provide criteria and say, I want volumes with these characteristics. Um, most commonly, that's based on things like performance, high availability, um, you know, things like that. Um, and the filter scheduler will automatically go ahead and figure out how to place that correctly based on the rules that you set up. Um, the other one that, that you can expose to your end user is volume types. And volume types are nice because you can actually say, I have volume of, you know, I, I want a volume that is gold tier or bronze tier or silver tier or whatever. And the admin can actually set it up so that those types are actually placed on specific uh, backends. So. So this is a simple um, design view of how the, the Cinder project is laid out. Um, so everything in that, that bottom uh, kind of purplish box um, are things that run on a Cinder node. Um, and then the, the Cinder client, of course, is external, and you can run that on any machine you want. And you don't have to use the Cinder client. You can actually just make curl uh, requests into the API as well. Um, but anyway, you can see we have a we have an API scheduler, 
volume service. Um, we have a backup service inside of Cinder, and then you have the backend drivers. Um, in the, in, you can have multiple backend drivers in the same setup. Uh, you can have one to you know, however many you want. Um, so that, that's just kind of, sorry, what was that? Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty simple architecture, and it's it's in line with with pretty much all of the other OpenStack projects. If you look at Nova, um, it's very similar to this. Um, it's kind of it, it's almost the exact same architecture. Um, here's another little view. Sometimes this, sometimes one is better than the other for people to look at. Um, this one is is more interesting because it actually adds in the the Nova compute piece. Um, so you can see where the users make their calls. Um, Nova gets volume information from Cinder um, uh, and, and does an iSCSI attach, so on and so forth. Um, the the key here is to keep in mind, you know, for the iSCSI case in particular. Um, the way OpenStack works is a volume is actually attached to the compute node. Um, it's not attached, um, it, it's not an iSCSI connection made by the VM. It's an iSCSI connection made on the compute node. So then it's a mount point which libvirt or KVM then passes in basically as a raw disk device. So you'll have a dev VDB or CD, whatever. Um, present on your VM, on your instance, that you can then just treat as a regular disk. Um, you'll do an F disk and a format and, and then mount it and use it just like you would any other disk. Oh, I went the wrong way, sorry. Um, so sort of a, a, you know, a summary of what, what Cinder's offering and, and what the differentiation differentiators are. Um, the, the whole concept is, is basically what I call um, virtualized block storage. So the idea is to give you a dynamic pool of block storage resources um, that's completely scalable horizontally, um, and that's both out and inward. Um, a well-defined, easy, and very easy to use API. Um, it's pretty basic. There's you know, create volume, extend volume, clone volume, attach volume. Um, those, those are the big ones that most people are going to use, uh, and so it's, it doesn't have to be overly complex. Um, when you get into the differentiators between what back end to use, the things that you look at there are going to be um, cost, ease of management, reliability, things like that. that. That's where all the differences come in. Um, for the end users, the main things that they're going to see are performance and reliability differences. So. Um, So the idea is um, all of this is self-service, of course. Um, once the admin uh, sets everything up, it's based on quotas, and it's up to the end user. They can go ahead and deploy and, and use whatever resources they desire uh, without any special requests or anything like that. Um, like I said, with block storage, it's, it's a pretty simple list of what you can do with it. Uh, there's there's more than this, but this is the basic. I mean, this is what 90% of your your work with Cinder is going to be. Um, so I, I kind of went ahead and I put some basic features on here. Um, so you know, extend volume. Obviously, you, you created a volume and you decided somewhere down the road that it wasn't big enough and you want to make it larger. So a nice little extend function there. Um, migrate. Um, is is somewhat interesting. It's it's kind of hidden from the end user in most cases, but it allows you to do things like um, if you had multiple backends and you you added a new backend and you you want to decommission some storage that you have, an admin can go ahead and migrate the volumes off of one backend and onto another. Um, so that's that's pretty handy. And of course, there's create and delete um, the types and extra specs, um, just customization type things there, um, cloning of volumes. Um, one of the, the really big things is um, boot from volume. So in OpenStack, your, your instances or your VMs are ephemeral. Um, so, and what that means is, you know, when that instance goes away or you shut it down or anything like that, all of your data that was on it is gone as well. 
Um, so a lot of people, they use Cinder as their persistent storage, and, and traditionally it was you just attach it as a mount point, and you have an extra disk, and that's where your data goes. But there are cases where you actually tune the OS, or you have a customized OS that you may want to keep around, um, in which case you can use boot from volume. Um, so what you do is you copy the image out of Glance onto the volume and then boot off of that directly. Um, and then all of your changes are persistent. Um, you have a, a durable copy of your, of your instance. Um, what's kind of cool about that is then you can do things like clone that instance as well. Um, doing things like grabbing uh, images out of Glance can be slow depending on your setup and what you're using, uh, you know, pulling that down over HTTP. Um, so things like this, depending on how you're architected, um, can significantly speed up, uh, you know, utilization in your cloud. Um, we offer uh, snapshots. Um, the reality for snapshots is they're mostly used for backend operations now, um, because we have implemented a, a an actual true backup uh, uh, functionality. Um, the way the backups work today. Um, is you can configure uh, Cinder to turn on its backup service um, and backup to an object store. Uh, typically, that's going to be Swift or, or Ceph's object store. Um, and the way that will work is it, it, will, it will literally just dump uh, chunks from your volume back over to your, your object store. Um, it'll create a database record with the information on the volume, where it came from, when it was backed up, so on and so forth, and then you can also do the restore. Um, so that's pretty handy. Um, that's a newer feature. It continues to grow. Uh, I think it's it's you know it's extremely important um, to have, and and over time it's just going to continue to get better. So um, you can transfer the ownership of a volume. So for example, if user um, Joe wanted to. Uh, create a volume and put some data on it and then give it to user Ann. You can do that. Um, and then I also, I talked about scheduling filters and, and per tenant usage quotas a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, I can go into more detail on those. But uh, I talked about the vendor unique features already, um, sort of, you know, what they're good for, what they do for you and how you can expose those to an end user if you want to. So you can expose those from a custom type. Um, by default, that's all hidden and abstracted out, but you can expose things if you like. Um, the, the, uh, the advantage there is you can have different storage devices for different use cases. Um, so for example, if you're running databases, you might want a special higher performance um, uh, backend storage. If you're just you know, testing an OS and, and messing around with something on a file system, um, you might not need anything really high speed or anything high performant, and it's so so you can use something lower tiered. Um, so the, the the bottom line is is what you do then is you just architect things to uh, select the back end based on what capabilities and characteristics your end user actually wants. So. Um, Setup is, is pretty easy on the Cinder side. Um, our config file is, um, is is getting pretty long, unfortunately, but um, all of the defaults are, are pretty commonly used, so you don't necessarily have to do a ton there. Um, the main thing you know here to talk about, though, is uh, you know types and extra specs. I keep kind of going back to that, um, but the idea is is you create a, an admin creates a volume type. Um, they associate some sort of extra specs with them um, that includes the, the name of the back end. That's all hidden from the end user. Uh, the end user only sees a volume type. So for example, you could say volume type gold um, has QoS settings of you know, 1500 IOPS um, with some max and, and burst rates as well um, that points to, for example, a solid fire device. Um, the end user only knows that he's getting a gold volume type, and that's all. So here's an example of, of how to configure a, a multi-back end um, Cinder installation. So I mentioned you can have multiple back ends, you can keep adding. Um, 
this example is of a, an OpenStack deployment I have that runs LVM as well as a solid fire cluster. Um, so you can see the uh, config file is pretty simple for both of these cases. So you, you, the, the first stanza there, you see the LVM, which is the name we're giving to that, that back end. Um, and then the parameters that the LVM driver takes. So it's just those three there. Um, and then the same thing for the solid fire. So here's an example of um, creating types and extra specs. As you can see, it's pretty easy. Um, only an admin can create types and, and extra specs. Um, so you can see they'll just simply go in here um, using this. This is an example using the CLI, and they'll create the types first, and then they will assign or set the uh, extra spec keys. Um, it's pretty simple. And then this is an example here of with SolidFire, how you do that to set up QoS values. Um, the other thing in IceHouse is you have the ability in IceHouse now to modify the type of a volume. So if you initially created a volume of type super, and then later you decided you wanted it to be super duper, um, you could actually send a retype command and it would migrate the data over to the other back end and set the appropriate settings on it. So from an end user's perspective, um, basically this is all they see. Um, they get to see the type list and that's it. And then they get to specify when they create a volume what type they want to use. So with that, um, kind of a, a little plug for SolidFire here. Um, not too much, but I just wanted to give you an introduction of what SolidFire is. Um, we're a scale-out clustered block storage system. Um, we were basically designed from the very beginning to be um, uh, used in an OpenStack environment as well as other cloud platforms. Um, our founder actually worked at Rackspace and worked on OpenStack and was trying to find block storage solutions for use at Rackspace um, when he came up with this idea. Uh, so he left Rackspace and, and created uh, a solid fire storage appliance. Um, so it's, it's definitely designed for, you know, massive scale deployments, uh, which a lot of folks, you know, kind of fall apart at. Um, linear non-disruptive growth. Um, so it, it really just fits in, in terms of scale, exactly the same way that um, uh, OpenStack is designed in terms of horizontal scalability. Um, Everything is, uh, one of our key features is our API. It's all automated. You can automate everything through the API, and it's a simple REST-based API using JSON RPC. Um, so, and then of course, there's uh, our fart, fault tolerance and, and things like that that we have that are, are a huge thing. Um, as far as our integration inside of Cinder, um, we have um, probably one of the most complete integrations, in my opinion. Um, uh, you know, I, I work for SolidFire, but my full-time responsibility is um, the OpenStack integration in the Cinder project. Um, so I definitely keep everything updated. I do significant testing, and we do a lot of um, work in-house inside of SolidFire, where we actually use OpenStack for our QA processes and, and other things. So. Um, we, we use OpenStack, we develop OpenStack, um, so, so you get a complete integration with us. So on that, um, I kind of, I, I have a couple of links here um, that talk about um, SolidFire and, and what we do with OpenStack, so you can check these out if you're interested. Um, goes through different things. We have some uh, webcasts on different things that you can do with Cinder, how to use Cinder, so on and so forth. They're not necessarily just solid fire, but they're more just general OpenStack tutorials. Um, we also write a number of blogs and, and information and stuff there you can check out. Um, and then most importantly, you know, for people that are sitting there that, that aren't involved in OpenStack right now, but are interested in becoming in, involved, um, I've got some links here. Um, the how to contribute is the best place to start. 
um, check that out. Feel free to contact me, um, you know, via IRC or via email. Um, get a hold of me. Let me know. Say, hey, I'm interested. I just don't know where to start. I'm happy to help anybody that, that wants to get interested or wants to get involved and contribute code. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be Cinder either. It's OpenStack in general. Um, and then, of course, there's my contact information. Um, and then, you know, for more information about Solid Fire, I've got some other Solid Fire contacts there as well. So, so um, you know, with that, I don't know if anybody has any, uh, you know, questions or maybe if you want me to, to log on to an OpenStack setup and show you some things or yeah. that can be dangerous, but uh, I'm always uh, try. Uh, any questions? Yep. Um, I'm wondering, there are a few uh, non-vendor specific drivers for Cinder that are not uh, that are missing a lot of features that Cinder has implemented, but for no technical reason other than that the drivers don't have the support coded in. Are they supposed to be dropped? I'm thinking of the NFS driver and uh, the Solaris specific driver in particular. Yeah, so those, those two drivers in particular are interesting cases. Um, NFS um, in itself, in my opinion, probably shouldn't have ever been a part of Cinder um, because it's it's just impossible. The semantics are, are completely different. Um, the behaviors are different. The expectations are different. Um, so the NFS drivers, uh, you know, they've, they've kind of gotten a pass on, on some of the feature things. Um, there are a number of things that we're working on, like, I don't know, if, if you look, we just finally implemented the extend on NFS, um, so that works. Um, there is a NFS-specific project that's that's being worked on uh, called Manila, um, and I'm hoping that once that takes off and gets on the road, I'm hoping that we can remove the NFS stuff out of Cinder so that it doesn't have that confusion and it doesn't have that API compatibility point. Um, and then to your point on the Solaris driver, the ZFS driver. Um, so we actually just sent out, um, uh, one of the core team members just sent out emails to uh, driver contacts to let them know that, hey, last release we said, you know, you have six months to get all the features implemented and everything up to date. Um, and if you haven't done that still, we're considering actually deprecating and removing your driver. Um, so that is something that's being done. Um, I don't see that happening. Personally, I, I wouldn't remove a driver in the next release. So six months from now, I still wouldn't remove it. But I would mark it as deprecated and document that, hey, it's, it's, it's not being actively worked on anymore. I'd also welcome anybody you know that wants to to step up and, and and help out on those drivers to do that. I've done that with some, you know, the sheepdog driver, for example. I did some work on a while back to try and get it up to date. Um, the ZFS the ZFS one, I looked at and I started working on, but um, to be honest, I just I haven't determined how much demand there is for that one and how much usage there is. So. Um, but if there's people that are actually using it, I'd, I'd strongly encourage them to, to participate and help out. Any other questions? No? Do you want to see some, some demo? Or? Yes. Yeah, for you guys who want. Okay, yeah, you can go ahead, John, and show us some stuff. All right. Well, what do we want to see? Break something. <laughs> Try to break. What's that? <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> I said break something and then fix it. Oh, break something and fix it. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I might need to connect my. Uh... It's broken. <laughs> Let's see if I can get my VPN to work.
Okay. So, um, I don't know what. To I don't know what they want to see or anything like that. Um, and here's a just a quick rundown of the word the GUI for um, for ISOS that's coming out. Um, we made some some pretty nice changes here. You've got these these different uh, sections you can pull up instead of going to different tabs. Um, so you can see here, you know, I've got these a number of instances in here. Um, I'm trying to think, I have um, a number of boot from volumes in here. Um, they're always kind of interesting, but let's look at volumes. Um, so one thing about the dashboard is it's definitely um, behind. It's always a little bit behind in terms of what features are, are available and implemented. Um, but let's go ahead and just look at a couple of things. So um, demo. Um, I want to create a, uh, a bootable volume, so I'm going to just make a little 2 gig volume. Um, and what I'll do here is I'll go ahead and I'll use this little Cirrus test image and create the volume. And so what that what that's doing right now is it, it created a volume on the LVM backend. Um, it attached it to the Cinder node and then it downloaded that Cirrus image from Glance onto it. Um, so now, right now, what I can do is um, see I can extend, uh, edit attachments, and create a snapshot. But what's more interesting is if I come over to instances and I say launch an instance, just give it some silly name, um, and select a source. And I'll, I'll show you some of these other things here in a second. But So what I'll do is I'll say boot from volume. And I'll select that demo volume that I just made. And then I'll launch it. And so it'll go through and it'll build it. Um, and then basically, there's my, my boot from volume that I have. I can log on. I can make modifications or anything else. Um, and then I can go ahead and throw it away later and spin it back up and get all my changes back. Or I can clone it. Um, I've got an example of a system right now that, that what it does is it goes out and it, it creates uh, an instance off of a template volume and does boot from volume with it. Um, and then it clones it uh, 20 times. And then each of those clones, each of those 20 clones does another 20 clones. Um, so I have a complete development environment set up and, and ready to go in about five minutes with um, with clo over 400 um, instances. So it's pretty handy, and it's got all of my dev tools, my compilers, everything else, all built into. It. Um, some of the other new things that are added in the dashboard now, um, you can see here. Um, We've got this um, boot from volume, and then we have boot from image creating a new volume, um, or boot from volume snapshots and create a new volume. So this is kind of cool, because if you do this now, you don't have to go to Cinder and create the volume first. You can just come in here and say, OK, just create this image um, and automatically create the volume and populate it for me. Um, so you can do that as well. So that's pretty handy. So these, I mean, these are really simple examples. Um, if, if you want to see something more complex, if you have, you know, an idea of something that you want to see, let me know because uh, I can definitely try and try and do something different. Okay. Anyone want to see something? We want to see this uh, 400 uh, volume <laughs> setup. All right. Yeah. I had a feeling somebody was going to ask for that. <laughs> All right. So this guy. So right now, um,
Okay, so right now I, I don't have much of anything, right? So let's go, and I'll just kick off the top level of this for now. Um, let's see. I have to remember where I was at. I was just working on this last night, so <laughs> um, let's go here. I, uh, All right, so I'm going to come here and I'm going to make sure that worked. There we go. Okay. Um, so I, I have a different, I, I have a number of different scripts here, and uh, let me make this bigger so you can actually maybe see it. So I have this this thing called Spawn Workers, and it's it's actually really simple. Um, So what it does is it just goes through and, and takes some some minimal input, um, and then basically you know first it goes through and it clones a, a bunch of volumes for me, and then it just boots them all up, uh, and that that's really all there is to it. Um, so if I do. Oops. So I'll just run this example right here, and this should work. Um, uh, okay, uh, so do that, and I'll give it, let's do, All right, so it's it's gonna. I, I'm actually since I'm still debugging this, um, I'm logging all of the uh, API calls and everything else, and that's what you see this starting new connection. Um, but if we come over to volumes again, you can see I'm creating all these volumes, all these clones right now. Um, so you see them go up in this this iteration. It's going to do the twenty. So you see those all kicking off. And then at some point, as they become available, we'll go over here and we'll see the instances start to move up. Um, oh, and what I didn't include is the next tiers. So, so what I would do is when I boot the instance, I would use Cloud Init Script to actually tell it to launch this same utility and same tool and do the next 20 on each one of those. I, I forgot to hit that. So 20 volumes, 20 100 gig volumes with Fedora running on them. We clone those 35 seconds. They're all ready.